As you were, if you would please take your copy of the Word and open it to Hebrews chapter 2. We'll begin from verse 5 and read through the end of the chapter. But our primary consideration this morning will be verses 10 and 11. Hebrews chapter 2. You'll find Hebrews, if you find that part of the Bible where all the T's are at and go right, skip past Philemon and Hebrews will be nestled right in there. Hebrews chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who, who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Amen. Let's seek the Lord's help in prayer as we turn to his word this morning. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and ask that you would help us as we consider your word together. Help us to receive your word earnestly. Help us to see you with greater clarity and help us to believe where we yet struggle. We ask that as your people, you would open our hearts. Help us to be those who faithfully praise you for what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Meet with us even now by your spirit and take us up that we might behold something of your glory in the face of your son, the Lord Jesus. We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, the epistle to the Hebrews is perhaps the most finely crafted text to be included in all of Scripture. Now, that's not to say that all texts aren't equally important. Every word of Scripture, down to the jot and tittle, is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. But the book of Hebrews has a certain panache. You know, a quality about it. It's marvelous. And speaking of Hebrews, Sinclair Ferguson said, So few things would do the evangelical church more good than a baptism into the letter to the Hebrews. And he's absolutely right. Especially considering the aim of this epistle and how the author accomplishes it. You see, the intention of the whole epistle to the Hebrews is that his audience would be exhorted to persevere in the faith, even in the light of of persecution. And the way that he accomplishes his purpose is by placarding the preeminence of Christ and the fullness of joy set before them, right before their eyes. There was much temptation for these early Christians, these Hebrews, to drift away from what they'd been taught in Christ and to return to the old covenant ways of Judaism. It's hard to say who authored the epistle, so I'll refrain from speculation. But it's clear that when the Apostle Paul is writing it, 
He does so with the express intention of displaying the preeminence and glory of Christ by exegeting Scripture. That's what we call the Old Testament. And he reminds these Hebrews that through this exegesis, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. He's the mediator of a better covenant, a covenant not like the old covenant. You see, the old covenant was faulty, but not because God's covenant was broken. As you see in Hebrews 8 and verse 9, it was Israel who did not continue in the covenant. It was Israel who was unfaithful. It was God who was faithful to his covenant with them by casting them into exile. The problem with the Old Covenant wasn't in the law. The law is good because God is good. The problem with the Old Covenant was in the sinner, including Old Covenant Israel. And in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verse 1, we see the Old Covenant sacrifices could never, never have made perfect those who would draw near to God. Everything about the old covenant life of Israel was meant to point to a heavenly reality that would be fulfilled in the fullness of time with an everlasting covenant. A covenant built on the better promises that God would be with his people. And his people would know him because he would be merciful toward their iniquities and he would remember their sins no more. What the apostle does is to show that in Jesus, the entire Old Testament finds its fulfillment. And in Jesus, all the promises of God are yes and amen. That's why the new covenant will be built on an eternal foundation of the perfect sacrifice. The one that would once for all purify God's people and cleanse their consciences to worship the living God. This whole epistle is geared in and around Christ. And it tells these Hebrews that in order to understand their Bibles, they needed to see that it testifies to Christ, who was the long-awaited prophet, priest, and king. He is a prophet exceeding Moses. He's a king that's far greater than David, and he is a greater priest than Aaron was. And that's where we come to our text in Hebrews 2. It's at the beginning of an exposition of the greatness of the threefold office of Jesus. You could say it's like the prelude. In chapter 1, we see that Jesus Christ is God because he is greater than the angels. The only one that's greater than the angels is God himself. And in chapter 2, we see that Jesus is truly man. He was made a little lower than the angels. And that it was necessary for him as a man to suffer. But the question that we want to ask this morning is why? Why did Jesus suffer? Why did he suffer like this? From our text this morning, I want us to see three reasons that will answer that question. First, we're going to see Christ suffering for our salvation. Second, we'll see Christ suffering for sanctification. And finally, we'll see Christ suffering for glory. That's Christ suffering for salvation, Christ suffering for sanctification, and his suffering for glory. Let's look first at Christ's suffering for salvation as we see it in verse 10. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make perfect the author of their salvation through suffering. As we come to our text, everything that the apostle is about to instruct us in is built upon the foundation that he's laid in the previous verses. That word for indicates that we need to go back in order to understand what he's telling us now. And in verse 8, we see that God is putting everything in subjection to the Son. But the full consummation of that has yet to take place. And the foundation upon which the subjugation of everything rests is the fact that this one who was greater than the angels was made lower than the angels and suffered unto death for everyone. It's by the grace of God that he did it. Notice that word grace. It's the grace of God that Jesus suffered unto death. So you see, Jesus suffering unto death was not some sort of involuntary act where his father pinned him to the cross and crushed him against his own will. This is not cosmic child abuse. Jesus himself tells us in John 12, as we heard earlier, now is my soul troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Or in John 5.30, I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Or again in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Consequently, 
When Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. The Puritan Stephen Charnock said this, the merit of Christ's death depended not upon his mere dying or upon the penal part in that death, but upon his willing obedience in it in conjunction with the dignity of his person. This sweet savor exhaled from his voluntariness. He was not dragged to his sufferings, but suffered more willingly than we had greedily sinned against God. We had conscience checking us in sinning, but Christ had no conscience checking him in suffering. It was his meat and drink to do his Father's will. Jesus delighted to do his Father's will. His heart was set on accomplishing all that the Father had given him to do. But we have to understand verse 9 correctly or we lose the entire gospel. All of it. The eternal word, the second person of the Trinity, does not need to be given that which he already has. He's infinitely and eternally possessing all the glory and honor due to his holy name no matter what happens in creation god is always most glorious nobody adds anything to him and no one takes away from him he's eternally blessed and he doesn't change but neither can we say that god the son somehow submitted himself to god the father in a manner of eternal functional subordination no that's we have to understand all that is in God is God, and that means that God is eternally Father, Son, and Spirit, each sharing in the divine essence, yet the essence undivided. This means that there is one will in God because God is one. So all the members of the Trinity act indivisibly. Just think of creation. Who is creation attributed to? Is it the Father? the Son, or the Spirit? Well, yes. <laughs> so when we read statements of Jesus being crowned with glory, or suffering, or hungering, or being submissive, we have to understand this as taking place in His humanity, who is God incarnate. The God-man, Christ Jesus, was crowned with glory for His suffering unto death as a mediator. Verse 10, 4, it was fitting that He from whom and by whom all things exist should make perfect the founder of their salvation through suffering. It was fitting that God should make Jesus perfect through suffering. To make Jesus perfect through suffering doesn't mean what we automatically assume that it means. Today, when we say something's perfect, we mean that it's as good as it can possibly be, right? That's perfect. Maybe think of home redecoration. You're sitting in the living room one day, all of a sudden the walls look a little drab, not enough light in the room, too much glare on the TV, couches don't feel right. So you spruce it up a bit. You slap some paint on the walls, get some new drapes, get a little light in the room, rearrange the furniture, and you look at it and you say, oh, it's perfect. It's as good as it can be. It's perfect. But that's not what's happening in this text. No, to be made perfect in this sense is twofold. First is to be made adequate for, not in the sense that Jesus was lacking or deficient, but that he needed to suffer like men in order to identify with them. You see, Jesus didn't lack anything. He was more of a man than you and I are. He was perfect. But in order to be a perfect mediator, he had to suffer with us so that he might redeem us. The patristic theologian Gregory Nazianzus, or G. Naz, as I like to call him, wisely said, what isn't assumed is not redeemed. What is not assumed is not redeemed. That is, whatever Jesus didn't take to himself in his incarnation is not healed. So it was necessary that Jesus suffer in every way like us, including death. In this way, he is the founder of our salvation, and through his suffering, secondly, he was consecrated by God unto that office, much like Aaron was in the Old Testament. Aaron was consecrated for his, offer, for his office by the offering of others, animals, animal sacrifices. But Jesus was consecrated to his office by the offering of himself. Jesus is the one that goes before us to conquer the way to victory 
on this verse, the Puritan John Owen said, the sufferings of Christ, which absolutely are the cause of sonship and reconciliation with God, are mentioned here only as the means whereby Christ entered into a condition of saving those who upon the count of his sufferings are made sons by God. But there's a big assumption underlying this whole verse, this whole section that we're dealing with, that, that Jesus had to suffer and taste death for his own, implies that suffering and death was fitting for his own, for them to experience. But suffering and death are not natural to humanity. It's not a natural thing for us to suffer and to die. Our, our first parents, we were created in the, upright in the garden. They were made in original righteousness to enjoy blessed communion with God. And when they fell into sin, Adam's guilt was imputed to all who were in him. The second London Confession 6.3 says, They, that's Adam and Eve, being the root and standing in the stead of all their posterity, the guilt of Adam was imputed and the corrupted nature conveyed to all his posterity by ordinary generation. That's just a really intricate way of saying that you, by nature, have a corrupted nature. You have a corrupted humanity. Everyone dies because of this corrupted nature. I don't know everyone in, the, in this building this morning. I know some of you. But there's some pretty good odds that someone in here is yet an unbeliever. Maybe you're here this morning and you're just looking for answers. Or maybe you've been sitting in the pew for years but if you looked at your heart honestly, you haven't really trusted in Jesus. You haven't wrestled with the fact that you don't have righteousness of your own. In fact, because of your nature, you are filled with all manner of unrighteousness. Even if it seems like you're doing good things. You're, you're unable to do anything good in the eyes of God because you're filled with unrighteousness in every thought, word, and deed. That's our condition naturally. And it's fitting for us in our rebellion to taste death and divine justice. But Jesus came to taste death for all who are His, even by death on a cross. Pastor Gary read the first portion of Psalm 22 for us earlier this morning. You see, Jesus' whole life was a life of suffering, but Psalm 22, it uniquely captures something of the suffering that Jesus took to Himself for us. The suffering that qualified him to be the captain of our salvation, it describes the horrendous physical affliction that Jesus faced in crucifixion. His body was broken, it was maimed, it was tattered. He was beaten, mocked, and scourged, and then he was lifted up and crucified. Jesus was despised and rejected. Jesus, only days earlier, rode into town with people shouting Hosanna in the highest over him. And days later, they'd be dragging him out of town yelling, crucify he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces this is the condition that he took to himself this is what he set his heart to do he did not revile when he was reviled and the angels looked on in wonder as he was more willing to die than they were to put him to death he was rejected by his own and the darkness did not comprehend him. In Matthew 27, verse 39, it's written, Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. You see, these religious leaders were so well versed in scripture that when Jesus takes the beginning of Psalm 1 to himself as he's hanging on the cross, they actually cited verse 8 back at him to mock him. You're the guy, right? You're the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Look at you, hanging from a tree cursed it was a tremendous act of spiritual blindness they expected messiah to come in power and to establish a geopolitical reign for israel that would last forever they expected him to thwart their enemies to vanquish the roman conquest 
but they missed that that was never the point. That was never the point. And they couldn't see that even in their mocking, even as they're murdering Jesus, he's showing them what true power looks like. They thought true power was in Jesus saving himself from the cross. And Jesus was showing them that true power was delivering many through the cross. And of course, in verse 1 of that psalm, we see that Jesus was forsaken by God. My dear unbelieving friend, there is something far worse than death. And that is to be forsaken by God. For him to withhold any blessing or sustenance except that which you need to suffer his righteous indignation for eternity. But by believing in Jesus and what he's done for all who believe in him, you can be forgiven of all of your sins and receive the righteousness of Christ unto eternal life. Let go of your sin. Believe in Jesus Christ. He bore the curse of God and in a public display of triumph walked out of the grave three days later. Brothers and sisters, the tomb is empty. And that means that all who are in Jesus will never be forsaken by God because he actually was. Why did Jesus suffer? The first way that we see that answer is that he suffered for our salvation by fulfilling divine justice by bearing our sins on the tree. He suffered for our salvation. But secondly, we see Christ suffering for sanctification in verse 11. Christ suffering for sanctification. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. And by sanctification, we just mean to consecrate or to make holy. That's to set aside under the Lord. Sanctification. When you think of sanctification in the Christian walk, it means that by the Spirit, you're enabled to turn more and more away from your sin and to turn more and more unto God. It's for you to be able, by the Spirit, to set your affections and your actions towards their appropriate ends, which is the glory of God. And in the Old Testament, it is expressly the role of God to sanctify. For just one example, consider Leviticus chapter 22, verse 31. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. But here in Hebrews, it's said of Christ that he's the one who sanctifies. That Jesus Christ is the one who sanctifies. And the new covenant people of God, the true Israel that Christ came to save, are those who are sanctified. Where old covenant Israel failed to keep the commandments of God, where they profaned his name in every way, Jesus kept every commandment on behalf of those who are his and sanctified his father's name in his heart. He is the one who brought his people out of true bondage and sin, the, the, the type of which the Exodus was looking forward to. He is the Lord our God. He is the one who sanctifies us, and he accomplished what no man on earth had ever accomplished in his life of perfect righteousness. He's the one who sanctifies. But the implications of verse 11 reach a little deeper. It says that he who sanctifies and they who are sanctified all have one source. If you look down in your ESV, you probably have a footnote. Sometimes they have it, sometimes they don't. It says that they are all one. Older translations correctly render it this way. And so we have to ask, what is the oneness that is being referred to here? What is the oneness that is the source of our sanctification? If you scan down in verse 12, you'll see that he refers to them as brothers. In verse 13, he calls them children. And in verse 14, the children share in the flesh and blood. And Jesus himself likewise partook of the same thing. So this oneness that's being referred to is the humanity that the eternal word took upon himself. It's his humanity that is the source of sanctification. It was necessary that Jesus assume human flesh and be made in every respect like us. That's because we need a savior. But we don't need someone just to die for our sins. We need someone to perfect our corrupted and depraved nature. We need to be brought up. We need to be made worthy to partake in the divine nature. What good is it to be forgiven from your sins if you're still unable to do anything that's good? 
It's no good at all. The Apostle Paul would make the same argument in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. This is not a T.D. Jake sermon where we're going to talk about getting all the money you want. That's not what's going on here, okay? Brothers and sisters, there is so much wonder in this statement. Though he was rich, that is, though he was divine, he's God, he became poor. Or as John says in his gospel, the word became flesh. He became poor. So that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. That you would be remade into the true image of God. And we know that when the eternal word assumed a human nature to himself, he didn't leave his divinity aside. He took poverty to himself by assuming a human nature while remaining divine. And as Jesus, he brings the riches to our humanity. In his life of perfect obedience, he elevates the human nature so that you, who are in Christ, are no longer impoverished in your wretched, sinful condition. You're made rich in the fullness of God through union with Christ and restored to the end for which you were created. But here's the kicker. Humans don't sanctify humans. Only God sanctifies. So it was necessary that God himself partake in human nature to scrub it clean, to sanitize it, to sanctify it. Did you ever wonder why Jesus had to be a baby? Why he lived 33 years, why he grew in wisdom and stature and he learned and read and exegeted scripture and did everything. Why he lived a life of suffering. It was necessary that he do it because he had to sanctify our human nature. And in order to sanctify it, he had to identify with it and live it in perfect righteousness. Every moment. The great philanthropist and civil rights activist Mahatma Gandhi you guys all know Gandhi, right? Was well known for his national campaigns to ease poverty, to expand women's rights, and to strive for individual freedom in India. And through his many years of campaigning, he was imprisoned many times for his efforts. To us, he's probably most notable for sayings like, be the change. Be the change that you want to see. In fact, Gandhi even claimed to be a Christian, and it was reported that the sole decoration hanging on the wall in his hut was a picture the face of Jesus Christ with a quote that said he is our peace but for Gandhi Jesus was just a moral teacher on one occasion he would say quote my reason was not ready to accept that Jesus by his death and by his blood redeemed the sins of the world I could accept Jesus as a martyr as an embodiment of sacrifice maybe even a divine teacher but not as the most perfect man ever born. Close quote. If Jesus wasn't the most perfect man ever born, then we are still corrupted in our nature and we are still lost in our sins. If he wasn't the most perfect man ever born, he is not going to be raised in resurrection because he has no righteousness. He has to be the perfect man. And he did it to sanctify our human natures. Why did Jesus suffer? Secondly, he suffered in the whole experience of humanity to sanctify it. He suffered for our sanctification. But finally, we see that Jesus suffered for glory. You see, the whole design of everything that we've been considering here this morning is to one end, one goal. That God, through the suffering of Christ, is bringing many sons, many sons to glory. If you're resting in Jesus Christ this morning, hear that sweet encouragement. You are going to glory. Feel it in your heart. Believe it. It is magnificent. If you're not struck by the fact that God is bringing you to glory, perhaps you've just not understood it. So I'm going to quote the Apostle Paul in the letter to the Ephesians at some length here. In chapter 1, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. In him we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. And brothers and sisters, did you know that you're a Christian because God in eternity set his love on you? He set his love on you and declared that you would be glorified in Jesus Christ. It's not because he looked down the corridors of time and saw you choose him. We've already talked about that. You wouldn't have made that choice even if you could. But here God tells us it's because he loved you. And because God is timeless and infinite and eternal and never changing, his love for you is all those things also. It's amazing. God is love. He is his own love. And he loves himself with this great and eternal love because it is the proper end of true love to love the most lovely, which is God himself. In the same love that he loves himself with, he chose you and made you alive in Jesus Christ. Mm. And the working out of that in time was when he sent his son to suffer and die for all who are his. And when he sent his spirit to open your eyes to behold the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and to believe in him unto eternal life. It's all of God. It's all his work. In January 2022, Officer Tyler Lenahan was tragically killed on duty. He was on his police-issued motorcycle reporting to the station when a drunk driver going northbound on southbound 99 collided with him head-on in the carpool lane. It was said of Ty by everyone that knew him that he loved his family tremendously, that he loved his Christian brothers and would have done anything for them, but that he loved the Lord Jesus more than anything. But my best friend, although he had this great love for Jesus and for his people, struggled every single day with whether or not Jesus loved him. Every single day with whether or not God loved him. He struggled with besetting sins and he was taught that what makes a Christian a Christian is Christian conduct. Of course, we're saved by grace through faith in Christ, but Christians bear fruit. Brothers and sisters, we are certainly supposed to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Absolutely. But that's not what makes you a Christian. There are things that we ought to be doing, it's true, and we have a very real responsibility for our lives as Christians. But you're a Christian because God loves you and by His Spirit opened your eyes so that you might believe in the Lord Jesus and have eternal life. He saved you so that you would experience the infinite blessedness of communion with Him as He pours out His love on you for all of eternity. That's why Jesus suffered. Jesus suffered to bring you to that glory. And because He's perfect, you can rest in Him and believe that you will be brought to glory. As we close and consider communion together, let's just consider these two things. Just two considerations for you. First, we should consider the example of Jesus who had his heart set on doing his Father's will. One of the toughest things to do is to evaluate yourself in light of that. To ask yourself, is my heart set 
on doing my Father's will and to ask it honestly. I'm convicted every time I do it. I often find that the more I grow in knowing who God is, the more I find out how, how truly sinful I am. But we have to ask ourselves this question, and we must repent or we're falling short. It's as my pastor Robert says, we're not the repented. We repented. We're the repenting. Those who repent, it's the Christian's daily struggle. We're the repenting. But know that when you find yourself deficient, you have a Savior who is all-sufficient and who has suffered for you. Secondly, be encouraged to continue in the race. You see, Jesus is the captain of our salvation. And as goes the captain, so goes the crew. We will suffer in this life. We will suffer in our sanctification. We will suffer in this sin-cursed world. But take heart, because Jesus has gone before you. Your suffering is not in vain. And because he has been tempted when he suffered, he is able to sympathize with you as you suffer. And because he's entered into glory, you will also. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. So as the apostle tells us in chapter 12, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Brothers and sisters, there is an eternity of joy awaiting you if you are in Jesus Christ. Look to him and run with endurance. See his suffering for our salvation, suffering for our sanctification, and rest in the fact that he will surely bring you to glory. He is the perfect foundation for our eternal hope. Amen. Let's pray.